Good afternoon. My name is Nicole Thompson. I'm from a company called HCML and today we're just going to be covering briefly looking at the kinds of pains and discomfort you may experiencing once undertaking a DSE assessment. Just briefly about HCML, we're a private rehabilitation case management company and we provide services to the employment and the insurance sector including case management for minor injuries as well as catastrophic injuries, managing long-term illnesses, sicknesses and absence as well as vocational rehabilitation. So the objectives of today is just to increase your awareness and understanding of the type of typical DSE injuries and related symptoms, what causes the discomfort and pain, so try and just have an understanding of why you're feeling the soreness, acheness and pains, what you can do, so some self-management tips and guidelines, and ultimately what you can do if it all goes wrong. What are the next steps? So what are your typical DSE work-related symptoms that you may experience? Early warning signs is any discomfort that you may experience. So if you're sitting at your desk in front of your computer, the minute you start feeling any discomfort, then you know something's wrong maybe with the way you're sitting or the way your desk has been set up, but that should be your early warning sign. You may experience some numbness, tingling, um, down your fingers, in your arms, elbows, from your neck all the way down. Tightness in your neck and shoulder is often the most common, and eye strain as well. So what are your typical work-related symptoms? We get the non-specific arm pain, which is, in other words, the discomfort, the ache and pain that you may experience in your muscles. Your upper limb pain, which could be your forearm, your elbow, in your shoulder, neck symptoms, shoulder pain and eye strain. And this is often referred to as your old RSI type symptoms, so repetitive strain injuries. And that occurs when you're sitting at a desk and you're repeating the same movement. So it may be the small muscle movements from when you're typing, or if you're constantly lifting something up from overhead, you're going to experience some pain in your shoulder. One of the biggest symptoms that we're now seeing is the neck and shoulder pain, and that's often caused by the laptop. Um, because this is a fairly large screen, but if you've got a smaller screen, you end up with your neck, neck in a flex position and you cause that strain and ache and pain in your neck muscles. I've got two pictures there which hopefully you'll see on screen. And what I want you to just have a quick glance and think about is what are the kind of risk factors that we can see with these two pictures. In the first picture, you've got a man at a desk in a very typical position, looking slightly stressed and harassed and trying to multitask. In the second picture, you've got a worker concentrating a lot on trying to see the screen. Now, we've got various different types of risk factors, and the um, obvious in the first one that you would notice is the environment. So the chair, the way the position is of the first client, the way that he's leaning on the desk, it's what we call an asymmetrical posture. The second one is sort of an exaggeration of the neck flexion and the muscles and the bending over, so it's that real hunched position that we see and it looks like a little bit of eye strain as well to see the computer. But I think the biggest and the most important factor that I'd want you to notice in the first picture is that the man looks fairly stressed. And this is often the risk factor that we miss when we're doing assessments and also the cause of what is the risk factor causing these injuries. So the main risk factors that we might see is one is long periods spent in awkward or flex positions. So that's when you're at your desk for might be 20 minutes, might be two hours, might be four hours where you're sitting in the same position and you're not getting up and moving. So it's that long time spent in awkward or flex positions. Again, when we saw the risk factor with the guy working on the laptop, it was this kind of position. Again, repet rep repetition of movements. So we see that a lot with the typing. Also, if you're doing a lot of mouse work, then you get repet repetition of moving your risk in that direction, which we're naturally not born to do. But the most important one is the suppressed feelings of pressure or frustration. And I think that's where the evidence is saying that it's not just the physical environment that could be the cause of someone experiencing neck, shoulder pains, upper arm disorder, and it may be that it's external factors. So it might be the environment or the behavior or even the organization. 
in this current economic climate when people are being made redundant and workers are expected to do more work in a less time frame, people are feeling under pressure, they're feeling stressed. And we all know when you're feeling a bit stressed and tired, you're often feeling it in your neck muscles. So you come to work, and even though work might not be the causing factor, work sees the effects and we might end up be blaming the work environment for that. So what can you do about it? I think the most important thing, we say don't move a muscle, move them all. Now we're not advocating people walking around the office aimlessly or starting to do provocative dance movements, but that you get up and that you move around. Um, don't try and sit and do all your work at, one, at once. Drink lots of water so you're having to get up, go to the bathroom breaks. We're all in the bad habit of emailing colleagues that sit in the office next door. So you want to be getting up, moving around, going to get a tea or coffee, going to speak to someone who's round the corner as opposed to just sitting at your desk all day. And if you do just remember one thing, it's don't just move a muscle, but move them all. When you move, then you are giving the oxygen to your muscles, they then become revitalized and that's when the aches and pains decrease. So if you sit, so in other words, if you're sitting in the same position for hours and hours on end, you in the end you're starving your muscles of oxygen, there's a build up of toxins and that's where injuries and aches and pains can occur. If you relate to going to the gym, you're excited, you haven't been for six months, it's your New Year's resolution, you normally can't walk for a week after you've been. And that's the same that you're doing to your body if you sit at a desk and you're expecting those muscles to keep you sitting upright, the muscles that keep your arm in that static position. So rotate your tasks. Um, don't just sit the whole day doing the same thing. If you're scheduling in meetings, don't schedule them in back to back, but try and have a morning one, maybe one at lunch, maybe one again at the end of the day. So you're doing different tasks, you're getting up, you're walking around, you might be telephoning someone, then taking notes, then writing it up on your computer. What you shouldn't try to be doing is on the telephone, taking notes and writing up on your computer at the same time. Keys to maintain a good working posture. Now it's easy if you're sitting at a desk that's at the right height and you've got a chair that's positioned in the correct place, but we do find with the changing workforce that people work from home, they might stop at a Starbucks at a, at a station, and those are not ergonomically set up. So you need to be aware of your posture and not as you find the day goes, you start slumping further and further into the chair and you end up typing on your laptop like this. A good thing as well is to get out of the office, so take a bit of a lunch break, get up, go and walk around for a little bit, come back and you'll feel re-energized and you then reminding yourself to sit yourself again in a good posture. Listen to your body. If you start feeling uncomfortable and you want to start stretching and moving around, that's a sign. Get up, move around, change what you're doing. One of the most important things is what we do call micro breaks. Now that doesn't mean stop working, it just means change what you're doing. So if you've been typing on a report for a long time, get up, take notes, make a phone call, again changing your position and use the self-education tools that are around. Chartered Institute of Physiotherapy have got some brilliant posters that you can stretch when you're at the water cooler or exercises that you can do while sitting at your desk. Um, the Health Safety Executive have also got really good online tools that you can have a look at and review to see what can I do to help decrease my risks in the workplace. Basically, one of the first things you can do to self-manage is to make sure that you, you do have a good setup. With the two pictures that I've referred to, the one of the skeleton is um, what we do often end up looking like, especially if you're spending the whole day, seven to eight hours a day working at the computer. By the end of it, you've got extremely flexed neck position and that's when you start feeling the aches and strains. So starting with your first one is you always want to make sure that you've got a good seating position. In the good old days, they used to advocate the old 90 degrees with your back, your hips and your knees, but we're not designed that way. And what you want to rather be doing is sitting in a chair where you are slightly more in a reclined position. So you're much more relaxed, you're much more comfortable, you don't have the strain and stresses in your shoulder, but you're a bit more relaxed. You're sitting slightly back. What you want to do if your chair does move around is to have at least five casters to give you a good stable base. 
Ideally, you'd want a height adjustable chair so that you can get yourself sitting at the ideal position at the desk. Because whether you're really tall or really short, you'd need to be able to adjust yourself. The second thing is to make sure you're sitting the right distance from your computer. Laptops have got different screen sizes, so you want to make sure you're sitting at the optimal length, which is roughly if you stretch your arm out in front of you, your tip of your finger should be touching your screen. So that's how far your computer should be from you. Again, if you're working from any documents, you'd want that document placed to the side of your computer screen or just below it so that your eyes can flicker between the screen and the document and it's not your neck doing this while you're typing and copying simultaneously. Um, you want to make sure that the glare of the computer is correctly. If you are sitting with a window behind you so the light's reflecting off the computer screen, do you look at the anti-glare options that you can put on your screen. Again, the position of your arms, you want your shoulders nice and relaxed, your elbows at a, a 90 degree angle. So if I was using this desk to work on a laptop, it's actually too high because it forces my wrists into what we call extension. And that's when you increase the strain and the tension with your tendons running through your arm. And that's where you could get injuries like carpal tunnel syndrome. So I would then want to raise this desk a little bit lower or my chair up so that your arms are in a nice relaxed position. You want your wrists in a neutral position and ideally you'd want it on a slight negative tilt. I've had to raise my shoulders just to demonstrate but normally if the desk was at the correct height then that's what you'd be looking for. Um, ideally you may want to, to be able to enforce a negative keyboard tilt, you'd want your keyboard lower than what your screen is. Unfortunately um, there's not always the budget to be able to buy these kind of um, solutions so that everybody's sitting in the ideal position. But what we do is give you best case scenarios and then you need to sometimes think of outside the box solutions to be enabled to sit, set yourself up at your desk in the correct position. For example, if your screen's too low, you can throw in a couple of yellow pages underneath it to raise your screen up. Right, so here we have an example of someone who's got all the equipment, but obviously not using it correctly. So that's why you've got to always tailor the equipment to meet the specific person's needs, because what's going to work for me might not necessarily work for you. So each person needs an individual assessment, and we need to make sure that all the equipment and what you set it up for meets that individual's needs, and not just a blanket ref sort of referral to be used across the board. Now laptops is something that most of us now use on a regular basis and unfortunately a laptop is probably your most unergonomic design that you do have and that's basically because the screen and the keyboard are connected. And if you think back to your sort of ergonomic principles, if your screen's got to be in line with your eye but your keyboard's down here where your hands and wrists are, um, that's not going to work for a laptop. So when you do use a laptop you need to think of what is the user going to be using it for. Is it a full-time user or only an occasional user? If it is a full-time user, you need to consider having a docking station and a separate keyboard and a mouse so that you're able to separate the screen and the keyboard. For an occasional user, we recommend that if you've got to compromise between wrist flexion and neck flexion, that it's easier to compromise on the neck. So you'd place the laptop in your lap sitting slightly back and tilting your screen back so you've got good support for your arms when you're working on your lap but that you're still able to see your laptop screen. You also need to consider the dimensions and the weight of your laptop. Um, if you're out and about a lot and you're carrying quite a small computer screen then you may need to consider having a desktop option or getting a larger computer and um, if the weight does exceed 10 pounds then we recommend you get a little pulley suitcase. So if all else fails and you find that you or your team or your staff members have looked at the ergonomic solutions to try and address specific pains and symptoms reported and this is still not working, what else can you do? Well, I think one of the first things you need to do is look at the other factors like we mentioned earlier. Is it something about the organisation? Is it something about this person's behaviour? Is it something maybe happening at home that might be affecting the way they are at work which helps to exacerbate these symptoms and also to 
professional help to go and speak to the line manager, to the HR department, to Oc Health, or if you do have a case management provider like ourselves involved, then that would be your first point of call. And they would often recommend and give some self-help tips um, over the telephone. For example, if someone is experiencing pain and neck pain, not to go down, rest for two weeks in bed, but actually to get up and about and to be active. Um, the ergonomic considerations together with the treatment is obviously often your most effective tool. So if you've looked at self-management, um, you've taken it to the next level and you've escalated to the HR department, then to review what other treatment methods could work. And it may be medical intervention, cortisone injections, it might be physiotherapy. If you are getting physiotherapists involved, the evidence suggests that a CBT approach is something that's most effective. So in other words, they address the sort of behaviours and thoughts and attitudes of the person as well. And that should hopefully address some of the basic ways on how to identify um, pain and symptoms, what could be the possible causes of it and the risk factors, and if self-management doesn't work and the tools of uh, your setup and the stretches that you've tried to employ, then do seek professional help from someone that could assist. Thank you.